Hi everybody, this is Brett Hancock. God bless you. Hey, listen, I'm going to try to do a little video here, taking a look at uh, basically Moses versus Jesus. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is actually look at Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to point out, I think a lot of people miss this. Um, when Jesus says what he says, I'm not going to go to other passages. Um, I could, but I'm, I'm not going to. I'm just going to Assume that you kind of know your New Testament a little bit. And so when I talk about these, like in the book of Acts, especially or whatever, that you'll know what I'm talking about. So um, so when Jesus is going through the Sermon on the Mount, you know, keep in mind if, if you're familiar a little bit with the Old Testament prophecies about Christ, that he would come. And, um, you know, Old Testament prophecies that say that, you know, he himself would come. And Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 34, 37, I forget exactly. Um, Jeremiah prophesies about there becoming a you know a new law that lo new law would go forth. It would be actually God Himself. Uh, passage like I said in Ezekiel thirty four thirty seven one of those where it says that He Himself would come and teach the people. Right. So the desires commands of God Himself would give to those people. Um, I think a lot of people jump to conclusions and think that He's actually going to teach them what He'd given Moses to teach the people. Well, the New Testament tells us. That in Hebrews chapter seven and eight, that the Mosaic law, you know, doesn't bring anybody to perfection. I mean, they they'll translate it that way, but it's the idea. That word is actually the idea of maturity. It doesn't bring anybody to maturity. God's purpose established with the lack of maturity with Adam and Eve in the beginning. The reason why they were vulnerable to evil is because of their lack of maturity. The purpose through the gospel, of everything He's doing until Christ comes back. All this toleration of God, this perseverance that God has been tolerating with human beings to execute his plan step by step, exactly the way he did within his foreknowledge, his foresight. He wasn't kind of doing it on the fly. Wow, that didn't work. Let me try this now. No, his whole plan is choreographed idea, God in advance or whatever. Perfect execution as he's laying things out. And so with the Mosaic Law step that he did or whatever, the, the book of Romans, I think, and there's other passages too, I think Galatians or whatever, but Romans points out that that the law basically just exposes sin. That's it. And, and a couple of times in the book of Romans, Paul has to slam on the brakes and then defend the law and say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not saying the law is bad. The law is perfect. The law is good. I mean, it's, 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 it's good, but... But because of it, like he explains until he started out in chapter 5, by the time he gets to chapter 7, he starts making it clear by using a first-person singular sort of uh, uh, literary device there, whatever that many people, you know, misunderstand. I've talked about in other videos where people take that out of context instead of realizing it's one big letter of Romans, those artificial chapter divisions that were put in like 800 years ago in our, you know, in the recent past, um, not in the time of Paul or whatever. That's not the context division. The whole letter is Paul's letter. And so some monk, you know, that did that, whatever, um, you know, at hit based on his opinion or whatever. Actually, it was Robert, Robert Stephanus when he was publishing a, a certain subsequent multiple copies of the Textus Receptus. He inserted the chapter divisions, and then 300 years later, they put in the um, verse divisions. But anyway... So, but their opinions of where those chapter divisions are is not where the the context divisions are the whole letter of Romans so anyway the whole letter of Romans is basically saying that um, the law exposes sin it's like a flashlight that's all it is it's just a flashlight it's not the technician to come in and fix anything it's just a flashlight it's a person that's holding the flashlight and say hey can you can you fix that I'll hold the light for you or whatever it's just the light that's all the mosaic law does it just exposes sin unrighteousness that's in the heart God wants to expose unrighteousness he wants it to be transformed into righteousness where a person becomes righteous and so the law exposes things by making it on um, what's subjective inside of a person and bring it out to make it objective right so um, anyway enough of that look I'm already four minutes into my video let's let's get into what we're talking about here so in well anyway just let me bring that to a close so in the book of Romans, it exposes sin. Paul has to constantly defend it and say, whoa, no, you know. And then in, in Hebrews, it says nothing can, you know, the law does not bring anything to, or the old covenant does not bring anything to perfection or maturity or whatever. Um, but through Christ, it does. I mean, Christ, you know, the whole thing is about that. And sometimes the translations really, you know, quite often, if, if you see in the New Testament, chances are if you see these words, it's what I'm about to say. There's a word 
that it is in verb form, adjective form, noun form, various forms, typically verb, adjective quite often. And it's this idea I talk about in a lot of my videos um, of I use the adjective example, teleos. And it's the idea that it's both mature, complete, perfect. Okay, so that's scattered throughout the New Testament. A lot of times many people just miss it. It's not in typical preaching of pastors or whatever because it's typically translated as complete or something. Everybody just kind of like don't even notice it's you know, it's significant or whatever. And it's scattered throughout the New Testament. It's the idea that Jesus describes in his, uh, in his uh, parables quite often talking about fruit. And it's this idea of you see a piece of fruit and when it becomes ripe, it's ready to be picked and to become useful to the farmer, you know, and it, which was intended to eat it, right? And so it's that idea of we are to become mature. We are to become complete, perfect, and Jesus said, you know, it's enough for a student to become just like his teacher, exactly like his teacher. So that's his desire for this. That's mentioned in a couple different Gospels in various ways, but that's basically the idea. So anyway, so let's get into what we're going to contrast between what Moses says in Matthew versus what Jesus says. And this is why Jesus says what he says. When he has to basically, before he starts in verse 21, talking this way, you have heard it said of old, fill in the blank, he says this like in five different passages, passages in chapter 5. We're going to look at them. Um, and then before that, he proceeds that with, Do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Right? So let me just throw this in there before I continue. Because some people have got a certain way of a lens they're, they're looking through to understand this. Paul, many places in the book of Acts, as I alluded to, I'm going to mention this. In the, many times in the book of Acts, is constantly being accused in some sort of way you know he's going into a new city he's going into pagan territory he's going into an area where there's jews or something whatever but he's being you know or he's going to the synagogue or whatever but he's being accused as if he's trying to undermine moses you know he's trying to undermine circumcision trying to undermine the mosaic law trying to undermine you know things of those things of that nature and so that comes up in the book of acts a number of times right and so we see him do certain things so that he can kind of go in as a Trojan horse and bring the truth to help them to see in the Old Testament these prophecies about Christ. That was Jesus of Nazareth and that they can believe, hey, the Messiah has come, the Christ in Greek or the Messiah in Hebrew. And so, you know, so that's, so that's the idea where because people are preaching what Jesus preached, it's very common for people to be accused of like, hey, wait a minute, you're, you're trying to undermine Moses. You're trying to do away with Moses. This is our, this is what, this is our heritage. This, you know, people get all fired up about it and stuff, whatever. So this is similar in Matthew chapter five. This is why Jesus starts out in verse seventeen before he gets to verse twenty-one. Do you think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets? I did not come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. I think people miss that part. Fulfill. Okay, that Greek word literally means fulfill, but it's it's the idea that's used with Jesus. On, well, is it the word that's used with Jesus on the cross when he said it is finished, it is completed, it's fulfilled? I think it's actually the teleos verb um, in a certain, you know, voice and mood or whatever, in a certain way to convey the idea that they translate as, you know, it's finished, it's completed or whatever. But, you know, it's him on the cross. It's him on the tree of life up there, which is the tree of death for him, the tree of life for us. You know, he's that fruit that's up there, just like in the garden. I've talked about this in other videos, where the whole thing was about a, a tree that was forbidden on the tr on the tree, or excuse me, a fruit that was forbidden on the tree not to eat from. He's that fruit up on that tree, which is the cross and stuff. So, um, so he he says that, but it's this idea, um, same sort of thing with this word. Fulfill means to bring something to completion. So what he's saying, I'm going to keep reading, but I just want to say this real quick. It's about completing it, not through throwing it out the window. That's what he's saying. I'm not throwing it out the window. I'm actually, I'm not going to bring it to completion by throwing it out the window. I'm bringing it to completion by actually fulfilling it, right? And so this is the way the early church understood it is when we look at these different passages, and I can make this a much longer video already. I'm approaching 10 minutes. I'm going to try to bring this to a close soon. Um, but um, so anyway, so let me, let me get into this. So he's bringing it to completion so that the law of Christ that could bring us to maturity, um, you know, can, can begin. So step one, which was the Mosaic law, which exposes sin. Now step two, 
the law himself. That's how the early church, Jesus is the law. So he came himself to teach people in a way that Moses was not allowed to teach them, wasn't intended to teach them. The Mosaic law doesn't bring anyone to maturity or perfection. You know, just like it explains in Hebrews, where it talks about Moses versus Jesus. I think it's like chapter 5 or 4, whatever. It says, just as the builder of the house, you know, is not greater than the house itself, right? And so just like Moses is not greater than the house itself, which is Jesus, right? Which is Jesus Christ, the God-man. Um, and yeah, Jesus said, there's no, no student is greater than his master. So it's about Jesus, not about Moses. It's not going to come and Jesus is going to come and be subservient to Moses by actually getting under Moses and, and preaching what Moses preached. No, it's about bringing it to fulfillment and now the major law. Now I'm going to draw your attention to some things as I walk through this. Let's, let's do this. So uh, let me pick back up again. Verse uh, 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth have passed away, not one yoda or a dot or, you know, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever, I'm using the ESV, by the way, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same thing will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, early Christians quoting this, right? So until he brings it to fulfillment, don't anybody do anything to, to abolish it. That's what he's saying right there, right? And he says, uh, um, but unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which... You know, if you're going with the Mosaic Law, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but if you go with the Law of Christ, it can happen. Um, you will you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21. You have heard it said of old. He's referring to Deuteronomy with Moses. You've heard it said of old. Basically, you've heard it said by Moses. You shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to the judgment. That's what Jesus or what Moses says in Deuteronomy. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother. Now, do you see the contrast there? It's like, you've heard it said of old, just murder. That's the big deal, okay? But I'm telling you, murder's not sufficient. We're getting to the core. This is why John the Baptist said the axe is at the root of the tree, right? It's at the root now. It's not just the out peripheral, out of peripheral of just murdering. No, it's actually the dealing with the heart problem, which is anger, right? So Jesus is actually attacking anger and saying, look, if you don't repent of your anger... You are, um, you know, you're basically hanging over the edge of the volcano of eternal fire. Let's keep reading. You'll see what I'm saying. But I say to you, anyone who's angry with his brother is liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother would be li liable to the council. Um, and whoever says you fool will be liable to, the, to hell fire or Gehenna. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, notice he's departed from the whole conversation about murder because that's what Moses is saying. But he's saying, no, 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 we're talking about dealing with anger here. And he continues talking about this because he's bringing us to maturity, to perfection. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. Go to him. First be reconciled to your brother and then come off your, off your gift to God. Come to terms with him quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to the court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and that you be put in prison. Now he's talking about actually like taking your life and then actually, you know, you'd be in big trouble after you die. The judgment and stuff he's talking about there. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Verse 27, here's another one. It's number two. You've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. Right? But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. List, looks at her lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, tear it out, cast it out, throw it away from you. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, you've heard it said of old. Just with Moses. Moses is like, no adultery. Jesus is saying, no, no, we're tapping into the cord. John the Baptist said, you know, the axe is at the root of the tree. You see this repeating theme here? We're at the core. We're getting to the core of things. Jesus, Moses never did that, right? So if you stick with the Moses, your law, your righteousness will never exceed the, um, the, right, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. And teachers of the law. Anyway, I'm going to continue on here. Um, verse 33, you've heard it said that it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, right? Swearing falsely, you take an oath falsely. In other words, you take an oath and you break it. You shall perform the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you. See, you can see that contrast there? But I say to you. Moses said this, 
and it was the outer perimeter. It's just, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. It's just, you know, about taking an oath. You can take an oath, just don't don't break the oath, right? But Jesus is saying, stop taking oaths. No more oaths. There's no more distinction between, hey, I I really mean it now. Now I'm really telling the truth. Jesus is saying, you got to be like that all the time. No more distinction between, you know, I'm kind of sort of telling the truth over here, but now that I'm taking an oath, now I'm really telling the truth. Jesus is like, that's evil. You're saying that's evil. Stop doing that, right? Um, so do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, earth or uh, for, it is, for it's God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. It's the city of Jesus. And do not take an oath by um, your head, for you cannot you know, make one hair white or black in your head. Um, let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything else comes from evil. Okay, here's another one. It's the fourth one. You've heard it said, it's basically you've heard it said of old, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Because now he's pointing to Deuteronomy again. He's talking, pointing to Moses. But he said, but I say to you. See, that contrast is, con- I'm going to do another one. There's a fifth one in here. It's the constant theme. It's like, it was this outer, peripheral, just murder. Now it's anger, you know. Um, before it was adultery. Now it's even lust in the heart. You know, um, before it was like, you know, these sorts of things oh, about, you know, t- taking an oath, but you broke the oath. No, that was what it was with Moses. But now that's not sufficient anymore. Now it, you don't take oaths at all. You don't swear at all. Now you always do what you say you're going to do. And James echoes the word of Jesus. Go b- read this in James. He talks about this right here with the oaths, not taking oaths. He says, um, everything else, uh, um, or no, he says, or else be condemned or else be judged. In other words, you do what you say you're going to do or else be judged, be condemned, all right? So Jesus said, you know, it um, comes from evil. And then James echoes the Lord's words and says, be condemned. That's how we understand the Lord's w- words. Um, verse 38, Matthew 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said of old, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. Okay, so now let's look at what Moses said. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What did Moses teach? Moses taught, you know, if somebody threw a tomato at you, you throw a tomato back. If somebody comes over here and takes your wife, you go take his wife. You know, I mean, you know, kind of thing. I'm not saying literally that's what he said. But I'm saying it's that kind of idea. You know, it's like judgment. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Whatever it is, you execute judgment now. The New Testament teaches, and I'm not going to get into those other passages here, but repeatedly, that judgment is suspended when Jesus came. Now is the dispensation of grace. Jesus says, freely you've been forgiven, freely forgive. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, and he says in Matthew 6 and other places, where he says, if you don't forgive, in Matthew 18, if you don't forgive, my father will reinstate your debt. So your debt of sin that you were forgiven for, he'll reinstate it if you don't forgive others or whatever. This is the time of suspending judgment. No judgment. Jesus came and said in John 12, 47 to 50, I did not come to judge, I came to save. He said, but there is a judge. And he said, my words, the very words that I'm speaking will judge them at the last day. So um, the Old Testament talks about what the early church talks about. Two advents of Christ. The first one, he comes as the Lamb of God to save. The second one, he comes as the Lion of Judah to bring judgment and wrath upon the world for everyone that did not respond to all that suffering that he went through and stuff. So... So right now is not the time of judgment. Now is the time, not for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was Moses. That's of old. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Quite a difference there, right? Love your enemies. So an eye for an eye. So somebody plunks out your eye. Somebody plucks out the eye of your dog or whatever. whatever. You don't go and, and revisit him with judgment. No, you forgive him. He says, love your enemies. Pray for, for those who persecute you that you may be sons um, of your Father in heaven. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the, the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you get? If you love those that love you. He said even the tax collectors, even the pagans, even the sinners do that. right? Even people in the world. When I used to live my old worldly life, I mean, I lived that way. I mean, if somebody was nice to me, I'd be nice to them back. But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. We'd be nice to everybody. Even our enemies, we love everybody. We try to help them. They're deceived by deceiving spirits and, and demons. We need to help them come out of their blindness and stuff. So that's what Jesus is saying. So anyway, I just want to make a video on that. Just wake some people up to some things about Moses. 
and uh, um, we'll make more videos. Actually, I've, I've already got like a, an hour footage of video on helping people to see that going back to the Mosaic Law with all these Hebrews roots things is not biblical. And um, I think a lot of a lot of it is from Scripture, and then some of it is from the early church writings and stuff or whatever. And I'm not done with it. It's probably going to be longer and stuff. But I just wanted to make this is already 20 minutes, so I'm going to stop this here. So anyway, I hope this helps you. All right, God bless.